Hi, everyone. Welcome. Use the chat to let us know where you're tuning in from if you are willing to share. Molly and I are in Seattle. Rebecca's in LA. Where are you? We'll get a few more people logged in. Portland, Iowa, Seattle, hello, welcome. Get a few more people logged in and then we'll get started. Brooklyn and Houston, welcome. Toronto, San Francisco. Ah, so fun. Thank you for sharing everyone. This has been one of the most fun parts of doing these is just welcoming you from all over the place. Vancouver, hello. Tallahassee, all right. Hello, hello. All right, I think I'm gonna get started here. And we'll just let more people join us as we go. Hi, everyone, welcome. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop in Seattle that's called Book Larder. And we are in Seattle's Fremont neighborhood during normal times or the before times or times when we can uh, sort of be together. We have a kitchen in our space and we host a lot of author talks and cooking classes in that space. And uh, during the pandemic, we've taken those to Zoom. And one of the great parts of that has been getting to welcome you from all over the place. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And also it's been such a great opportunity to get to welcome authors from all over the world as well. And so I'm especially delighted to welcome Rebecca Pepler tonight. She uh, did actually join us in person when her first book, Aperitif, came out in 2018. And she was also in conversation with Molly Weisenberg then. Um, we have a beautiful new book to talk about tonight, Atab. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you so much, all of you who have ordered it from us already. Um, I will drop a link in the comments if you want to get the book. Rebecca sent us very nice signed book plates. So you'll get a signed copy. Um, and by buying it from Book Larder, um, you support this talk and the things that uh, we're doing in all of our programming. So um, we are going to, of course, leave time for questions um, during the conversation. If you could please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in Zoom rather than the chat. To, um, to ask questions, that would be really helpful and make it easier to keep track of those. You can use the chat also to talk to each other if you want to. Just make sure if you want other people to see your comments that you choose um, all panelists and attendees when you're in the little chat box. And then everybody will be able to see and you can, you know, like I said, talk to each other if you would like to during the event. All right, so let's get things started. Um, Come on, please join me in welcoming Rebecca Pepler and Molly Weisenberg. Hi guys. <laughs> Hello everyone. Oh, this is so fun. Rebecca, I'm so happy to be here with you again for a second time, this time Love from it. our respective West Coast places. <laughs> Brought out my best <laughs> furnishings for you. <laughs> it's looking great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also be sure and remind everybody about your first book, which we talked about uh, at Book Larder like three years ago. Yeah. Um, anyway, so for those of you who might be ordering a copy of Atab from Book Larder tonight, throw this one into your cart too. Really wonderful, lower alcohol cocktails for perfect for this time of year. So anyway. Um, well, so I, I, I want to start with like sort of the, the broadest questions for people who might be new to your work. Um, will you talk a little bit about your background in food, how you came to do this? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a it's a winding story. Um, but I studied journalism in college and I knew I, I always knew I wanted to write about food, but I didn't really know what kind of path that would take. I had hoped it would be cookbooks and I'm very fortunate that that hope was realized. Um, 
but I moved from Wisconsin to New York to go to pastry school um, to kind of just get a kind of broad strokes idea of the industry, knowing that I wasn't going to go work in professional kitchens. Um, and then started working as a food stylist in New York, which was a wonderful career that I still do, um, but am now based in Paris um, and come to New York and LA well, frequently prior to the pandemic to do that work. Um, but when I kind of shifted my focus from food styling into writing um, was around 2015. And I just, I kind of knew that I needed a change in order to make it stick. And I really, really wanted to focus on, um, on books and kind of long form writing. And so I decided to split my time between Paris and New York. Um, and and voila, two, two books later and five plus years later, I'm, uh, I'm still going. Um, but so my, so my background is kind of all over the place. I worked in television for a while um, and editorial and then shifted into the kind of the book sphere um, with the first book, which came out in 2018 and, and now at top. And did you style both of the books? I did. I, yes. I knew that. I mean, maybe yeah. I, maybe I did and I've forgotten. Well, yeah, I was, yeah, I produced and styled and, and I'm sure Joanne and my team will tell you that I, I micromanaged everything on the table as well. But, um, but yes, I, I also prop styled, um, as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> for I reasons wanna... are unknown to me at the end of the day, now I have a hundred plates in my Paris apartment, but, uh, they're all very beautiful. So I was going to say you have absolutely gorgeous everything in, in both of your books, but um, you. I was actually, I, I, I sold a copy of your book to my mom this afternoon. <laughs> I, was, I was telling her about like, um, I, I feel like this book is, um, it is so, this, uh, maybe this is the wrong word, but so like uh, wholly conceived, like it's not just about the recipes. It's also, mm -hmm. there's such a strong feeling that comes through the visual side of it from the typeface mm -hmm. to the photography, the way that the light catches someone's glass. Um, will you talk a little bit, and I, of course I wanna talk about the, the gender aspects of, of this too, but will you talk a little bit about, um, how you came up with sort of what you wanted this book to feel like. Yeah, um, so coming into the book, I knew I wanted it to feel like my table um, in France. And so it has, it's very much a personal perspective, both um, the recipes that are in it are ones that I have tested and retested on the friends whose photos, um, who are in all the photos as well, all of them are, are my friends who have eaten around my table. Um, and yes, from the typeface to the voice, to the images, to the people included in the images and the, um, attention to detail in those images and in the text and in the typeface and, and throughout the entire design of the book is very thought out, um, and always for a purpose. And so I got to work with such an incredible team. The designer of the book, Lizzie at Chronicle is just amazing. I think I sent her like a three page design brief, which is, you know, probably a little long, but felt short to me of like things that I wanted and kind of from like, you know, very specific ideas and like font um, things that I love. And also these like broad strokes ideas, which we'll kind of get into a little bit, but, you know, wanting to include female form. And I wanted to um, create a book that felt like modern France um, and didn't delve into all the cliches that um, are so often kind of leaned on when you when you write about France or, or create um, images that evoke the feeling of France. Mm -hmm. And she just like nailed it and then was like, how about we also do this? And so the, the book is even better than I, I could have ever dreamed. Um, and that's due in part to Lizzie and then also Joanne, our photographer, who also shot Apertif. Um, and we just kind of sat down and had a bunch of wine and talked through everything. And, and um, we're so lucky because, you know, we're friends and the group of friends that are shown in the book are also her friends. And so it felt like a very intimate, fun, um, relaxed atmosphere while we were shooting. And then, you know, we would finish a shot and then we'd all sit down and eat the food. Um, and it was just, 
really wonderful to kind of create that intimacy throughout the book in all the different ways. Um, and it was from the very start, something that I wanted to, to really showcase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also loved your attention to detail around things like, well, it, it's, um, you know, you, for me, really made the idea of sort of the, the fantasy of a French evening feel new again and, and not cliched as it so often is, it, it's so often made um, into sort of a, an American um, fantasy version. And, yeah. and I think part of, of what I really loved about it is, is, yeah, the way that you managed to say, to acknowledge that fantasy um, mm -hmm. and, and the power of it, but to talk about how to actually make that feeling a reality through both mm -hmm. the food, the way that you choose to host people. I loved what you wrote about, um, I loved what you wrote about your approach to hosting, not just the yeah. sort of um, sexy humor of it. Um, I don't know <laughs> if other people have, have perused the book, but one of my favorite parts is um, when you, what page is it? Oh my God, I can't believe I didn't mark it. When you say, um, oh my God, I don't want to butcher this, Rebecca. I should have looked it up. <laughs> is it the Dom in the kitchen? Yes, there we go. Dom in the kitchen, sub in the dining room. There yep. we go. Yep. Yes. But what yeah. I really loved about that is, um, I mean, not only was it just really smart, um, the idea <laughs> that, um, that you are constructing an evening and you are being really mindful about it and you're also taking care of other people's needs, mm -hmm. but also that you, um, you reminded people to take care of themselves as hosts to know their limits. Mm -hmm. And also um, I really loved, especially because you write a lot about alcohol. I really love um, how friendly this book is to all different kinds of people, whether they drink alcohol or not. And I think that's mm -hmm. something people might not know about your work since you are so good at cocktails. I write about them a lot, that is for sure. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that um, I made a very big point of making sure that while there are, of course, plenty of alcoholic drinks in the book, I did want to speak to the experience of not drinking. And that stems from, you know, I think the way that we interact in modern times. I have so many friends that either aren't drinking for a lifetime or aren't drinking for a year or aren't drinking for a month or are pregnant or, you know, choosing not to drink for all these reasons and none of them really matter. What matters is that they're at your table and you want to give them something that they'll enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets um, kind of set aside when you talk about entertaining a lot because everyone kind of talks about, it. I mean, I did this in the book, it's before, during and after and before and after um, have aperitifs and digestifs. And I think you kind of forget that you don't have to make it alcoholic for it to be special. Um, if you're someone that drinks. And of course, if you're someone that doesn't drink, you know this already. Um, but I think when you're inviting people into your home, uh, it's really important to always have, I always have like sparkling water at hand because you also never know, even if someone normally drinks, if they're coming in and they don't want something to drink that evening, um, that's alcoholic. And so that was really important for me to kind of spotlight. Um, but in general, the Dom in the Kitchen sub in the dining room uh, is something I had wanted to write for a long time and kind of had taken notes as I, I'm sure you do as a writer, you kind of like jot little ideas down. And that one sat with me for probably three or four years. Um, and I was kind of looking for the right space for it. And it didn't, I couldn't really find a home that uh, was right. And I guess I was just waiting for this book. Um, but it really does sum up how I feel about entertaining and bringing people into the space and also creating a space for you to enjoy it. Because what's the whole point of having people over or inviting people into a space that you're hosting is that everyone has fun and you are included in that. Otherwise, I truly don't see the point um, unless you're getting paid to do it. And then by all means, you know, like set that aside and do what you need to do. But um, I certainly don't get paid to invite people into my home and um, 
and have dinner with my friends. And so I want to enjoy it just as much as they do. And so I, I kind of know my limits and uh, have learned theirs and uh, make sure that everybody, you know, has a good time mm-hmm. or can have as good of a time as I can provide. And then the rest is up to them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, will you talk a little bit about the food in the book? So as, as you mentioned, it's the book is divided broadly into before, during and after. Right. And am I correct that it's just before and after that have drink sections, right? Yes. And that food appears in all three of the sections. Will you talk about your approach to cooking? Yeah, well, so it's broken down into the way that you would come to the table in France, right? You always, even at the most casual of dinner parties, you're going to have a little apropos to start. And so that's a little drink, low in alcohol, no alcohol, a glass of wine, what have you, and always a snack. There's always something little to nibble on, whether it's potato chips or olives or one of the larger um, snacks that I include in the book. Um, and then you move on to the rest of the night. Uh, depend, it might be dinner at your place. It might be dinner out, whatever it is. And so it was really important for me to kind of set that before scene. Um, the during is mains and sides. And it has, I was talking to a friend actually the other day who um, doesn't eat a lot of meat and actually assumed that I was vegetarian for a very long time until this book came out. Um, because everything I made was, you know, I knew that they weren't a meat eater. And so I never really put meat on the table. Um, or if I did, it was, it was a small dish that other people could enjoy. And I'm not a big meat meat eater either. Like I, you know, sustainably sourced things will come onto my table every once in a while. I know the farmer, I know where I bought it from and, uh, and I feel good serving it and eating it but I wanted to kind of include encapsulate the whole of the table. And so there are actually more meat dishes than I would normally include in a book if I were writing it just for myself. But there's also so many vegetarian or pescatarian leaning things. Um, And that's one of the reasons why the sides section is so robust is because I'm a big fan of sides for dinner anyway, and kind of combining three different sides on a table, maybe a main, but like, I rarely touch the main. I'm just like all for like the salads and the snacky things and the bread and butter and the aperitif um, moment. And, um, and then the end of the book, the after, uh, as I mentioned just briefly in the beginning of this conversation, I went to pastry school um, in New York. And so dessert has always been a big part of my private life, my personal life, but with aperitif, uh, my first book, I wasn't able to include it because it's, you know, all before the meal even gets going. And so that was a very personally special section to write for me. Um, And then of course, digestives, which I think are such a wonderful way to end um, any meal, even if it's just like a small little sip. Um, You can see my bar right now has like a tiny little mezcal on there and that's what we're drinking um, at the end of the night here. And it's like, you know, just one little sip to kind of cap the evening and truly kind of feel like you've ended it. Um, and so I wanted the book to be representative of the way kind of a table, a tab, um, progresses throughout the night. I um, I posted a photo on Instagram of, of how many like post-it notes yeah. I put in my book, but I was- just I love like, that they're heart-shaped too, by the way. No, I don't know where <laughs> these came from. I think they were like a gift to my daughter from one of her grandparents or something. I love it. Anyway, now I've used them all. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just love the way that you write recipes. I mean, even, even this, I think is so inventive, red curry squash with cider and saucisson, Mm -hmm. um, or the, um, God, I really love the idea of the salade verte with cornichon vinaigrette. Um, I make that still weekly. That's one of the recipes. I think any cookbook author will tell you there are some recipes that they made so many times they don't want to make them anymore for a while. And then there are some that they can't stop making or people in their life won't let them stop making. And that one is, is a weekly rotation. At this oh, point. I'm excited to try yeah. it. Yeah. I also, um, I have to say, I'm a real sucker for things like buttered peas and greens. I'm so <laughs> glad you put something like this in here. And I also, I want everybody to see like how beautiful this photography is and how, um, how sexy it all is in a way that is so smart and um, and a way that really suffuses the whole book. 
Um, and Thank it's just you. this added layer as though the recipes were not enough. Um, <laughs> and I want to talk a little bit about that because I've never seen a cookbook that, um, that asserts such a clear point of view and mm. build such a comprehensive world. And I remember noticing in Aperitif that um, there were only, that the only people who show up in this are, are female identified people. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. remember talking with you about that when this book came out and thinking, oh my God, why? Like that, it makes such a difference. Um, yes. Even if all you're seeing is hands or a part of an arm, the feeling, your book has um, a real care for like the female form. And I wonder yeah. if you would talk about your decisions aesthetically um, and maybe politically uh, in terms mm -hmm. of gender about this book. Yeah, so it, the same with Aperitif. Um, I thought a lot about kind of what it means to queer a cookbook um, in the making of the book, from the from the images to the text um, to the general just mindset behind it. Um, and it shows through most easily, um, I think, or quickly through paging through the um, the images. And just with as with Apertif, um, everyone included in the book, as I mentioned, are my friends. And um, all of them, except for one, are women. Um, Tibo, uh, my sweet, um, as we refer to each other, I, we're, we're gay French spouses for each other. He always has said he would marry me if my visa goes sour. We haven't had to come across that yet. Um, but he, he kind of was the lone um, man that made it into the pages. But also, um, I was very careful to include uh, women and or queer identifying folks. Um, and that was really for a lot of reasons, but one of them is simply to create a space that I wanted to see and that, that I think it's underrepresented, especially in the cookbook world and even more so in the kind of French book world. Um, and so that was a very, very important point to me. The other kind of like related idea of including female form kind of came through because I think sometimes, especially in the cookbook world, we somehow, um, even though when you come to the table, you're often with someone that you um, find sexy or want to find sexy or is to some degree have some sort of intimacy with um, an intimate connection in the form of friendship or romantic partnership and all these things. And I think sometimes we like, get rid of that in the cookbook space. And we kind of like set it aside and it's all about the food. And I really wanted to create um, a space that did feel sexy and uh, the recipes and the people that are in eating them and the way that you're eating them should be thought of as, um, as an intimate act. Mm -hmm. uh, and so throughout the images in the book, we did, you know, some of them are a little bit more explicit and we really like kind of leaned hard into female form. There's like uh, the cheesecake, I think it's, now I didn't write things down. Um, the Alsatian cheesecake. Yes, yeah. The cheesecake image is, is with a friend of mine. Um, and it's just like the light, it's golden hour, it's sexy. Um, we're, you know, I asked consent if I could put my hand on her leg and I'm looking directly into the camera and we cropped. Um, so you're not getting direct eye contact with me in that photo. But I wanted it to look like, you know, it's the end of the night and you're sharing, you know, cheesecake with, with someone that you love. Um, and that was one of the mini images that we kind of like leaned hard into kind of like really making sure people knew that this is meant to be sexy and it's meant to be queer. I think another one of the images is uh, the Goûtez Moi um, cocktail, which I actually just posted a photo on my Instagram as well. So if you don't have the book, you can look at that. Um, but I had a shirt embroidered with the words Goûtez Moi, which means taste me. It's the name of the drink. And then it's a very, very tight shot with the, the cocktail in the forefront and then kind of my lips and body in the background um, and clear um, or blurry in the front, clear in the back. Um, and when I talked to Joanne about that, I was like, I really, I want that to feel very like you're part of this space. And like, I'm holding this drink in front of you when you look at this image rather than 
kind of having the reader or the cook that's at home with these images not interact with them. Yes, thank you, Molly. This is the that's, image that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's so, it was so good. I When I went to have it embroidered, I was like, I want lipstick red and she really nailed it. So I kind of got to match my lips to the shirt. Um, and then I couldn't wear the shirt for, for a while and now I can finally wear it and uh, the cat's out of the bag. Um, but I really, I, you know, I fought through very specific images like that. And then I fought through the entire book like that. Um, and even like the cover shot, which is a continuous one, um, one shot double page spread that then wraps around the book um, is, you know, goes all the way around and has like little hints to female forms. So you have like my favorite little lady likes nutcracker. Sorry, the sun is like hitting me very intensely right now. Um, and then these lovely little uh, napkins that I had embroidered with um, silhouettes of women that I had drawn. And so from even before you even open the book, you kind of know what you're getting yourself into or have an inkling to it. And you're not as surprised when you kind of open the book and see that it's, um, you know, we're all adults here and it's, it's a little bit more of an adult content um, rather than, uh, than anything else. And that was, that was very intentional. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, you know, you, you and I were talking about um, how the, the sort of tone that, that cookbooks are generally written in it is a, a pretty narrow emotional tone. Mm -hmm. Like um, if, if other people are referenced within the text or in the photography, it's sort of this like either um, I learned to cook this at my grandmother's knee or yeah. kind of this like coy winking, like this dish is the way to a man's heart kind of thing. And yeah. this is so, um, it makes me realize how, how neutered a lot of our conversation about, about food really is mm -hmm. when, um, you know, it, it, it is a tremendously intimate thing. And there are so many ways to have fun with that or yeah. to welcome that to the table if, if we're awake to it. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was really fun to write. It was, um, I think this book, even more than aperitif is very much in my voice. And, um, you know, when you write for, uh, other publications or when I'm working as a journalist, I need to kind of like narrow myself into, into the voice of what, whoever I'm writing for, um, or kind of the general public, because we don't know who's seeing it, but with a cookbook with your name on it, you get to be, you know, very much your, your best self. Um, and I was very cognizant of that and worked um, very hard with my editors to make sure that I was kind of sticking to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of that was talking about, you know, um, like one of the recipes is like my ex-girlfriend's apple tart, um, my French ex-girlfriend's apple tart. And it's, um, it's one of the first uh, recipe titles that I wrote. And it was, you know, it's the easiest recipe. I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't working super hard in the kitchen in order to make it, but it's a recipe that's very special to me personally, but also incredibly French and like very much something that she learned from her mother, but I didn't learn it from a matriarch figure. I learned it from a woman that I fell in love with in France. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's, that's, I'm very fortunate that I have those stories to speak to. And also that my publisher kind of allowed me to tell them in such a um, a straight way. Like it didn't feel like I had to kind of like cage around it. You're right. Or like tiptoe around the, like my identity. Um, instead I got to lean into it very much and kind of showcase it and have it become, you know, part of Atab rather than something that, you know, like, oh, this, this queer expat woman in France wrote a cookbook and there's one article on it. Rather, it's just a, it's an entirely queer cookbook and the articles can focus on that, but they can also focus on the actual content of the cookbook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, your head notes are such a pleasure to read, um, both <laughs> for for your your wonderful way of really accurately telling us what this is going to taste like or mm. why we should make this, but also for the humor in it. Like, I have to say, the first recipe that I, you know post-it noted in here mm -hmm. because of the head note it was the other 50 50 
yeah. <laughs> the four cocktail section. Um, I'm just going to read a couple sentences from it. You say there's the 50 50 martini, which is the recipe right above this one. And mm-hmm. then there's the other 50 50, which is on another page. This might be my favorite drink in the whole world. And the first woman to batch it and put it on tap will be my wife. I love <laughs> it. I love that you were like throwing down, like, yep. the, the race has begun. It Whoever has. Batches, just puts it on tap. All right. I know, I know. Let's get to it. <laughs> it was really fun. Um, Thank you. I like to think, um, and it, it's a huge compliment coming from you because I, I adore your writing um, and really have uh, spent a lot of time with it. And so that's very, very wonderful to hear. Um, I also think that I like to say that I'm funnier on paper um, than I am in person, which I am sure you know my closest friends might um, disagree with, but in general, I feel like there's there's kind of a space that opens up for me as a writer that I don't, I can't really access in the moment. And so getting to write um, these head notes that are a little more personal were so special to me because it's actually my true voice coming out um, yeah. and getting to kind of hone it and make it fun and make it sexy and um, make a joke and then kind of sit with it and be like, oh, that is kind of funny or have my editor read it and be like, oh, you're allowed. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing now. And so you can keep this. It's not just you that thinks it's funny. So that was, that was nice. (laughs) I love hearing you say that. I, I feel like, um, I often, I often feel like the voice that I have in writing is, is my best self. Yes. Um, and anyway, yeah, it's so interesting because yeah, I think of the voice in this book as very funny and like very (laughs) clever. Um, Thank you. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Um, Well, so we're going to transition in just a few minutes to some questions from the audience. So if anybody has questions for Rebecca about any aspect of this book, um, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A. And um, in the meantime, I have a couple more questions for you. Um, So you mentioned that the the salad with cornichon vinaigrette is sort of a regular rotation one, a a Mm -hmm. classic for you. What are, I don't know if this is a, a, you know, the the question that every cookbook author hates, but what are the (laughs) recipes in here that are the ones that you reach for most often? So, um, it's such, it's a good question and a, and a, and a hated question because I love them all. They're all my, you know, proverbial, uh, recipe children. Um, but but yes, the salad with carnation vinaigrette is one of my favorites. I also, I reach for the sardine rex, which is a, like a, basically a non-recipe. It's just smashing sardines and butter together and then putting them on bread or crackers or whatever you have on hand. Um, and then another one that I'm making with total regularity, although my partner makes the aioli part of it because I hate doing it. Um, is the grand aioli, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's such a great recipe. It's in the before section of the book. Although I did, I, I kind of threw it back and forth in the TOC a bunch because I, I serve it as a main very often, um, or as kind of like a apéro de natoire, which is just kind of a large apéro that you keep eating and eating until it's just dinner. Um, Wait, that word again, apéro de natoire. Ah, okay. And, and so say again what that means exactly. Oh, so it's like, um, if you take a, it's apéro, apéritif, um, which is the colloquial way of saying apéritif. Um, dinner spa is uh, just dinner, um, kind of the oh. dinner version of apéro. So you're, you're kind of, a kind of making a mess dinner. of food and snacks and drinks and just eating and drinking all night long, but they're not like a main course um, dish isn't set out. It's just all little snacky things. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of my favorite way to eat anyway. I'm like a huge fan of the snack dinner. I do a little note on it in the book. Um, and it's often the way that I eat, whether I'm entertaining and having people over or not. Um, but that recipe is great because it's just whatever crudite vegetables you see at the market that are great, whatever you have in your pantry, crackers and bread. I always have tins of sardine, um, which is why I wrote them into the recipe. Although uh, in France, they often use like, um, like a white fish sometimes, or even like a poached or uh, like leftover roast chicken they put on the side to make it into kind of a dinner main rather than just a starter. Um, But I mean, any excuse to dip things in aioli is, it makes my day. So I think I've been reaching for that one 
with regularity these days. Um, I noticed as I was going through the book again before we talked today, I was lingering on the recipe for upgraded potato chips. Yes. <laughs> which um, I love the idea. So it's, so you basically take potato chips, but you're seasoning them and yes. sort of toasting them a little bit in the oven. Is that the idea? Yeah. You basically take a bag of potato chips and like dump them out of the bag, season them. You warm them up so the spices stick. Um, and then I often just like dump them back into the bag and serve them like that. Um, it's like an easy way to bring it. If you're having like a echo outside of the house, you can just kind of do that. And it makes it a little bit more special, but even in the house, like we often in my apartment in Paris, I have like a little balcony area. And so that's often where we have drinks before dinner. And so usually we're standing, I have little side tables I set out, but like there's not enough space for everybody to sit down. And so passing a bag of potato chips is much easier than, you know, heavy bowls, breakable bowls on the, on concrete terrace. So yeah. And potato chips are, you know, my go-to snack. So I think with this book, people have seen truly my love for tin fish and potato chips, like kind of come through screaming. <laughs> I feel like um, between like tin fish, potato chips and cocktails, we've got it all covered. It's like, it's, I would be happy if that were my kind of desert island meal situation. Well, and the, these potato chips in particular caught my eye because, you know, I mean, I think we're, we're still going to be gathering with other people only outside for a while. Yes, um, and so I really liked the idea of, um, you know, while I can't wait to have everyone over for, you know, a big leg of lamb. <laughs> um, one of the other big dishes in the book. I yeah. really loved, um, I could just imagine having some really great picnics or drinks with friends this summer in the park um, yeah. outdoors with these recipes. Yeah, absolutely. And so many of them translate very well. It wasn't necessarily um, a thought that I kind of consciously had when I was writing the recipes for the book, but a lot of them you can transport easily. Even if you make, you know, one of the mains like the mayo roast chicken, you can serve that cold, you know, and I, I personally am like a huge fan of um, room temperature uh, chicken. I don't know why, but um, I always feel like it's just like you can just let it set aside and then you kind of snack on it. Um, and that can easily just be like packed up and brought to the park and kind of set out as like a, you know, a special meal that still is safe. Uh, and so many of the recipes, including the potato chips um, and many of the cocktails actually translate really well to that. Um, I, I'm looking at the Q and A, uh, and I have to say, so uh, a friend of mine, Hannah Colette, is here. Hi, Hannah. And Hannah yeah. says, "No question, just overjoyed to have a book that celebrates cocktails and potato chips." So I wanted <laughs> Thank you to you. Know. Me too. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna start working my way through the, the Q and A mm -hmm. here. Um, let's see here, which recipe took the longest or was the most difficult for you to develop? The Queen Amon, that, oh God, that recipe. I, I really, I kind of like did it to myself. Um, so a lot of the recipes that you see for Queen Amon, so Queen Amon is a, it's a cake, it's a, it's a cake made in Brittany, but it's really just this like slab of, uh, like sugar dough that kind of fries itself so much in the oven because it has so much butter, it kind of like cooks itself. Um, and it's eaten in the north of France. Um, and you really don't see it done well outside of Brittany. Uh, it's made with the good butter, it's um, incredibly decadent, and it's got the like caramelized crust and like super flaky inside. And so a lot of the recipes that I've seen are for kind of um, individual ones because you kind of get, the, it's easier to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, the way that I eat them and the way that you see them kind of eaten in France is with the big kind of nine inch, um, Queen Amon. So I really wanted to write that recipe. I didn't think it was going to be this hard. If I knew like hindsight, I would have probably not done this one. Um, and kind of like kicked myself that I put it in the table of contents and couldn't kind of get out of it. Um, but my, my very good friend, Lena, who is the styling assistant on the book, 
um, and also just an insanely talented chef in her own right, uh, came to my house and we made it over and over and over again until we got it right. Um, and it took a lot of tests and a lot of butter. Um, but I'm very proud of that recipe at the end of the day. So mm. thank you. That's such a good question. Um, here is a question from Taryn. What are a few items you keep in your pantry or fridge that you think more people should stock up on? That's a great one. Um, one of them that I always have is Pimon de Espelé, which is a Basque um, pepper. It's a, it's like, um, kind of like a, if you mix smoked paprika with cayenne, but didn't have that like kind of heavy kick, it's a very subtle, sweet spice. That's one of my favorite things to have, and it makes its way into a few recipes in the book. You can always swap in smoked paprika or cayenne for it, but it's really special, and I and I wish more people had it. Um, when I came to LA a while ago, I, I looked all over for it and ended up, you know, only finding it in one place. And so I recognize that it's harder to find, but um, when you see it, buy it and a couple others, and like gift them to friends, and you'll be happy that you did. Um, I mean, tin fish, which we've talked about enough here, but that's, you know, I have a pantry full of it. And one of my favorite things about tin fish is it actually ages well. Um, they get better in the tin. And so if you buy too many of them, they just keep getting better. Um, and I mean, I think everybody kind of talks about this in the food industry, but I think it bears repeating is kind of good staples. I have a bunch of different salts um, that I like, but fine sea salt and a good flaky salt are kind of my number ones. And then really good butter and really good olive oil. I don't, I, I spend my money on them. Um, and I use them for um, finishing and for, for specific recipes. And then I get, you know, a little bit less expensive um, for everyday kind of cooking and like sauteing, but it makes a huge difference in the final dish. Uh, even just like, you know, making your vinaigrette with a really good olive oil versus, you know, something that might not be as um, fresh or mm -hmm. uh, sustainably made. It just makes a, makes a really big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here is another question. Um, so a couple of the recipes in the book are influenced by other cultures, for example, the banh mi. Could yeah. you talk about the experience and inspiration of these dishes um, as they've been brought from other places back to France? Absolutely, that um, you hit on something that I was very careful to include in Atab. I wanted this book to be a, uh, emblematic of modern France and modern France and the way that we eat in France is not all coca vin and, and bouillabaisse and um, you know all these very very classic recipes while they exist they are also one of many things that are made um, and there are so many cultures that have made it into French cuisine whether that be through um, immigration to colonization to uh, a bunch of other less fun to talk about, but necessary to kind of touch on and and respect. Um, and so I included quite a few. There's, um, there's a tagine in the book. The banh mi is actually one of my favorite recipes. Um, and I, I think about that recipe actually quite a bit. Um, there's a casprut, which is a Tunisian um, recipe as well that uh, kind of made its way into France and is often made with a baguette now, although that's not the traditional bread that's used. Um, that's what I use in the book and what's possibly easier for people to find here. And so I was really cognizant about creating a balance of recipes that felt both familiar for, for Francophiles that wanted kind of that like classic um, take on French cooking, but to be perfectly honest, all the re recipes are modernized. Um, they're not going to be, if you want a very classic recipe, I highly recommend Mastering the Art of French Cooking. It's amazing. And I didn't need to write, no one needs to write that book again. And so I think it was very important to me to kind of nod to tradition and also nod to what makes France such a beautiful country and food culture um, that it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, I mean, the banh mi recipe, I just, it's, it's very good. I highly recommend making that. Um, here's a question from Lindsay. How did you find your food voice in Paris, a city that seems so exclusive 
or so maybe set in its ways. The city was such a long history in food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think I found it the way that you find your voice anywhere in the world, which is to try a bunch of things and talk to a lot of people and um, make some mistakes and learn what you like uh, and kind of then hone what you're good at and um, and continue to learn. And so for me, finding my voice in in France is is an ongoing, evolving um, uh, situation, um, both literally because I'm still learning French and also um, within the food that I that I make um, and learn from the culture. I think that the benefit to living in Paris is it is a metropolitan city with a lot of influences and a lot of um, acceptance of um, expats coming in and learning and contributing to the culture. And so I think that if I had kind of chosen somewhere else in France to move to first, I might've had a harder time, but the Paris that I have found, um, this is broad speaking, has been quite accepting of myself and my voice and, and my um, eagerness to learn. And that's been, that's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Alyssa asks, what are your favorite spots to eat and drink in Paris? <laughs> it's, I get asked this all the time. It's so hard. So we didn't touch on this too much, but if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I have been sick for a very long time with COVID at this point. And so I got sick right at the beginning of the pandemic and I'm still uh, dealing with long COVID. And so I have not eaten or drank out in Paris since February of 2020. Uh, so I think my recommendations are probably a little dated, but um, <laughs> I am going back in May and, and planning on uh, you know, safely investing in restaurants again and um, and so we'll see. But um, some of you know, my favorite places to go back to aren't actually um, specifically restaurants or bars. It's actually the like canals and the park culture that I'm very much missing and that I very much look forward to getting back to. Um, it's where, you know, on the canal um, Saint Martin or on the Seine is where in the summer, spring, summer, any good weather, Everybody goes and sits and has FOO and are meeting friends and um, and kind of sharing this um, this moment in time that's very 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 rooted in French culture, but also very accessible to anyone um, and open to anyone. And so, for me, I think I'm missing that, and also my local wine shop because, let's be honest, it's it's magical and I love it um, more than than actually kind of any specific restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I miss my cheese shop too. I'm excited to go back. <laughs> there is no substitute for a proper French cheese shop. There's not, there's no. really not. No, it's a, it's, it's a magical feeling when you get in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's see here. I think we have time for a few more questions. Are you, are you okay with that? Yeah, totally. I'm here. Um, Stephanie asks, who are some of the chefs who inspire you? Mm. And if you wanted to cook for one of your mentors or your favorite chef, or if I can take the liberty of expanding this, I don't know, maybe your favorite writer <laughs> to cook for. Yeah. Um, I'll kind of back into that answer and that I would cook for, I, I'm a huge, um, poetry fan. And so I would cook for a myriad of poets that I love. Um, right now I've been reading a lot of Ellen Bass. And so I would probably drag her into an apero and, and force feed her everything um, and just listen to her talk. Um, in regard to, uh, I think that I'll actually answer it. The people that inspire me aren't necessarily chefs, although I have a great respect for what people are doing in professional kitchens especially for this book, the people that have inspired me are home cooks. Um, and, you know, for, for many of the recipes, um, like the, the cassoulet, which is kind of, I think, the second to the crema in the, in the most difficult recipe to, um, to perfect in the book, if only because it takes forever to make. Um, I 
kind of begged my friend Thibaut to take me down to his aunt's um, who lives right outside of Carcassonne and Toulouse, which is kind of the region that Cassoulet was created in. Um, and uh, we went out and had Cassoulet. And then the next day, she, I just stood by her and asked her a ton of questions while she made it. And then we ate it again. And then I went into a full food coma and I never wanted to eat Cassoulet again in my life. But um, she, she and so many other French home cooks, I think, were so important to me and kind of understanding what I needed to include in Atab and also what it actually feels like to cook in a, in a French kitchen mm -hmm. every, you know, we three meals a day as well. And so, um, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, and then also the friends um, that I cooked for were so inspiring because I have one of my best friends is, uh, she'll, she, she'll know who I'm talking about. She's not a cook. Uh, she's getting much better now. Um, but when we, when we first started becoming friends, she, you know, was really interested in everything I was doing, but knew kind of nothing about it. And so she asked all these really, like, I don't, I hesitate to call them basic, but basic to me questions that I kind of thought were just like everybody knew because I had been working in food for so long. And it was such a refreshing moments to kind of recognize what was important to um, hopefully some of the readers of Us Hub who aren't coming from, you know, a very like serious food background. Um, and I was able to incorporate kind of the things that I learned from um, the questions that she asked and kind of what she learned and what she took from it. Uh, and that, that was a huge teaching moment that kind of continues on. Um, so I think, I think more so than uh, professional cooks, I, I looked to home kitchens for inspiration, especially for Atta, but in my, in my life as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question about comfort foods um, that you've been making in lockdown. And, mm. and I, I'm especially curious about that because I, I've you know, read a little bit of what you've written about your experience with long COVID um, which I'm so sorry you've been having to go through that. Thank you. <laughs> um, are there particular foods, you know, uh, e even the simplest things that have been real staples for you during this time? Yes, um, not super French, although there is a region in France that um, specializes in rice. Uh, but for me, rice is kind of my comfort food first and foremost. And so when I was, when I was first sick, we didn't really know what we know now um, and what the kind of symptoms of COVID were and how they kind of progressed through the body in, in general terms. And so I lost my sense of taste and smell long before that was actually something that we knew people were losing. Um, and so I relied quite a bit on, 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 on cooked down rice on congee, on fried rice, on things that were really easy for me to make because I was also alone um, in Paris. And we also didn't know, you know, when I was very sick, of course, I was, I was sure that I was contagious, but we also didn't know how long um, you're contagious for, especially when you're dealing with long COVID. And so I didn't see anyone or allow anyone in my space for a long time. And I kind of, you know, I had some great friends who would drop food off at the door and kind of groceries but I was kind of fending for myself and I was also very, very sick and unable to cook the way that I'd like to cook. Um, and, and that when you're in a healthy body can give you comfort, I wasn't able to do that. And so I relied on a lot of rice, a lot of kind of crackers and um, those kind of things. And then I um, learned that I had a gluten intolerance. And so I had to kind of shift some things around, but fortunately, fortunately the rice stuck, um, the soy sauce just had to go. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that sounds yeah. so intensely difficult. It was it was intense. I was very fortunate that all the recipes in the book were developed and tested already, and so I didn't have um, I didn't have to worry about that aspect of uh, of finishing the book. I was still in edit, and so we did I did a lot of work, but fortunately, it wasn't physical work. It was um, intellectual work, which I mean was very difficult to do, but at least I didn't have to get up and move around for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I'm gonna ask one last question. Perfect. We'll end on a, a real food note. So- <laughs> Yeah, let's um, not end on long COVID. That's-, that's Yeah, no, not we're not, we're not gonna anyone. end on long COVID. 
there there is a, there is is so much beyond long covid there is okay um so uh, i'm sure you've heard of like marriage chicken or like proposal chicken mm -hmm. so if, if there were one recipe in this book that you would think of as like your version of proposal mm. chicken or like what you would make for someone to get them to be yours forever I have a very, I have a, a real life answer to that in that my partner, um, when I made Bougere for her for the first time, you know, jokingly said, marry me. Like, these are the best things I've ever had. And so I think that, I think I would, I, the Bougere, the extra large Bougeres are my, um, are, are my ticket to love. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh yeah. my God. Okay. Yeah, right. I know that was a, that was an easy answer. I, yeah. I, I thank her for giving me that one because otherwise I, you know, no idea. But <laughs> I think oh that my gosh, well, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you to Book Larder for hosting us. It's it's such a treat to see your smiling faces even from afar. And um, hopefully next time we can be in real life again. <laughs> oh, you too, Rebecca. I, I yeah, I can't wait for whatever the next book is. Um, and maybe I'll see you before then, which would be great too. So. Congratulations on this one. It's really lovely. Um, Molly, thank you so much. Oh, I know, look. Much. Thank you so much for, oh, there we go. There the, we go. <laughs> Molly, thank you so much for such a thoughtful conversation. Thank you everyone for all of your questions and for joining us. I could see people were, you know, like having cocktails from your book while <laughs> we enjoyed this. Um, Molly, shout out to your hair. I mean, you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my, my secret is today is the third day past washing it. There you go, everyone. Style secrets. Yeah, right? But yeah. I love it. Um, so this available at booklarder.com. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca and Molly. Thank you, everyone. And have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.